please come into my room. to the second installment of the Mustache Room podcast. Uh, glad you're back, or if this is the first time, thank you. Um, hopefully the word will spread. Uh, this is an awesome space. I love the people that are on it and will be on it. And today we have my friend Chris. Again, only first names at this point because we're just having fun learning. And Chris is a buddy of mine. We've been cultivating mushrooms, not together, but we've been doing our own separate experiments and have shared notes and some auger, which you'll learn about uh, down the road. And all that good stuff, but a uh, really cool guy, a good friend of mine, and uh, we talked today about Spawn, so hopefully that is interesting. If not, uh, hopefully you will still find our voices soothing. Quick shout out to both the official and unofficial sponsors of this podcast. Officially, it's just Mustache Brands, M-U-S-T-A-S-H Brands, mustachebrands.com. They have all kinds of awesome products for lifestyle enhancement, collapsible products, dog lover accessories, uh, some really cool tech. And check them out, mustachebrands.com, M-U-S-T-A-S-H. Unofficially, hey, <laughs> uh, because it's unofficial, I can just pick and choose who I want. People, we love sporeworks.com. Get your mushroom spores there for your cultivation project. Also, Home Depot, Ace. Ace is great if you just want to go down the street and talk to a guy for 30 more minutes than you have to uh, about a screw. A um, little homey there, a little a little slow. But we love them, and we bought a lot of stuff there to help with our monotubs, et cetera, et cetera. So thank you to those unofficial sponsors. There might be more. Uh, you're welcome to all those prospects in advance. This is episode two. Uh, you're awesome for listening. Enjoy. I appreciate you being here, Chris. Hell yeah. What's Hell up? yeah. And the enthusiasm is just <laughs> <overflowing>. <laughs> This is episode two. Uh, we had a little welcome episode that doesn't count. This is episode officially episode two. Mm-hmm. Um, are you are you a podcast veteran? I never asked. That. I have never done a podcast. Before. Never done a podcast. So I'm not a big cherry popper when it comes to podcasts. Sure. I'm not willing to like take you through every step of the game. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, if I can acclimate you to uh, at least a, a studio, a headset, a, a mic, a mic cover. Uh, my annoying cat from time to time. Occasionally. Any one of those things that'll make me happy. All right. You are not only one of my good friends, but you're also an amateur mycologist like myself, and uh, I find that super awesome and nerdy. I'm definitely dipping my toe into it. It is uh, becoming more and more consuming. <laughs> it, it's uh, yeah, I mean, have you now? I watched uh, Fantac- Fantastic Fungi, which yep. I told the audience uh, the last time I spoke to them. Um, I know you had seen that, and that movie is freaking amazing. If that doesn't like, if that doesn't seal your interest or just like plant the seed of of, of loving mushrooms even more, I don't know what would. No kidding. I think that uh, I mean all of the applications that they talk about inside there. Uh, uh, it's just, it's incredible that it's so diverse what you can do with it. You know, uh, and I was telling my non mushroom fan friends and family members, I'm like, you got to watch this. You know, I was being evangelical about mm-hmm. it, which I don't like to be unless it's really mm-hmm. worthwhile. Um, so, thank you for your recommendation, and I'm just glad we followed up on that. Heck yeah! So, Chris, the pro- the podcast, as I had explained to you, um, I'm nerding out big time with uh, mushrooms. Um, it certainly you, looks that way. I think uh, Brody, by the way, he just did a drive by fart. I don't know if you Jeez. smell that. I think so. I don't know if that's <laughs> you and you're disguising it as a Brody fart or what, but I think that's what he did. He just crawled under the table, dragged a fart with him, and now he's gone. Yep. He just said, see ya, bitches, and <laughs> dragged a fart <laughs> through the podcast studio. Thanks, buddy. Yeah, good old Brody. <sighs> so Brody's not going to speak on the podcast. Um, he'll, it'll be unsolicited barking, but... Um, and the occasional drive-by he fart. He will drive-by fart like a mug. So, <laughs> so back to what we were talking about. Um, yeah, the... The situation that you see next to the podcast studio, the uh, the ten active monotubs of uh, various strains of psilocybin or psil- psychedelic mushrooms, I'm proud of this setup. And I think you and I, you know, you talked me through some of it. I feel like you contributed to to this setup as well. Well, I, I appreciate it considering how much you contributed to my setup that I'm working on, and hopefully one day it'll grow up to be a, a little bit more similar to this. The automation is just so smart. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I mean, I still would probably, even if it wasn't automated, I would still come down here and like just nurture them constantly. Of course. <laughs> but it makes it a little bit easier. I could actually have a life outside my mushroom monotubs. No kidding. How many strands are you I would say I have like uh, four or five right now. Okay. Um, 
Oh, let me turn off the air. Uh, so the podcast studio is in the basement, which Chris knows, and uh, Patrick is the other uh, guest that has been on. With it being in the basement, we are uh, exposed to the furnace and the bathroom piping and a lot of things that are going to contribute sure. uh, uh, to the ambiance of the podcast. Let me turn off the um, air so that that's not uh, the extra mic that nobody wants to hear. All right. And we are... Doopy doopy sure, doop. you can run your AC from your phone as well as your monotubs. You like that? Well, well done. Yeah. And we are off. And whatever interference that was, come on. Yeah, everything's got an app, but my garage yeah. has an app. Um, we might get a, a new stove and dishwasher, each of which have their own respective apps. <laughs> I mean, it can go, <laughs> it can get crazy. It can get crazy. Jetson style shit. So with our mushroom, with our journey so far, so... I, in the last episode, I talked Patrick through kind of like some of the early phases of cultivation. Mm -hmm. And I know you and I, you know, we've talked uh, at different intervals about, you know, um, how to get started and how to gather supplies and whatnot. Um, but I do want to talk about a couple things that we were hitting on earlier that I think will be relevant sure. to the audience. Um, one of those things is do, do, do. Um, we wanted to talk about. Spawn, right? We wanted to talk about creating spawn? Yes. Okay. So in the last episode, I talked a little bit about, you know, you might do the PF Tech me method, which I think you had started with, Chris. So, so what I started with was I had a syringe. I inoculated some jars. That so were you had a spore with, syringe. Uh, right, a spore syringe. Okay. Inoculated some jars. Um, I wish I could tell you exactly what was in them, but there was <laughs> rice flour, I think, was the primary food source. Brown rice flour. Yep. And a vermiculite. And vermiculite, yes. Okay. And then let it populate. And where I kind of fell flat on the first one is I didn't let the jars fully populate. Okay. So I got until I saw mycelia everywhere, but not until it was a nice, solid white cake. And so my first flood or my first shot at it didn't quite go anywhere. Which, I mean, <laughs> it's, and I was telling the audience, and at this point, I hope our audience is, it's a vast audience, but uh, likelihood is just, just like my mom and my sister, and huh. maybe me just making sure everything went okay. Huh. Um, but yeah, I was telling the audience, it's it's a pretty precise process. Like, sure. if you fuck up, um, I mean, you're, you may have wasted weeks, months getting up to that fuck up process. Sure. Um, so... But I think mycelium not fully colonizing, like, that's not as big of a fuck-up as, like, a big pile of mold. Sure. <laughs> Although I did have about I, – so I had eight jars, and I think six of them ended up with mold. Okay. I just the, – the cleanliness process can be meticulous. But then it just – like, every one of those jars, I was like, man, next time I'm going to do it this way. And next time I'm going to change this. And it just kinda kind of makes you want it a little more. Yeah. It's <laughs> like a, learning an instrument. Like, every week you get a new chord or – Something like that. I'm not an instrument guy, but that sounds... I think the jargon's right. Chord? Yeah. yeah. No, that sounds about right. All right. Um, <laughs> yeah, we'll abandon that topic. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it is. it is. It, you, you tweak it. Uh, you tweak the process. You know, we're, we're, making, uh, we're making beautiful drugs. So, I mean, yes, it should be a cumbersome process. Anything that, that's that amazing should be cumbersome. Absolutely. If it just grew willy-nilly because sure. I just put A with B, that's, that sucks, right? Right. I want it to be A with B plus C minus D plus F minus mm -hmm. C plus Q. I mean, yeah. that's, that's a better recipe. You start with a recipe and then you make it your own. I think that what's what I've found fascinating about it is how easy it is to want to get so much more connected to the whole process. Like, just like anything else, you could go buy it or you can actually participate in getting it out there and getting it for yourself. And it right. just gives you a deeper appreciation of, like, how people have used these. So. And plus, buying it is hard. Uh, I mean, first of all, <laughs> right. not everybody has mushrooms on the ready, like sure. waiting for you to buy from them. Right. And you can't buy them at a store or sure. online. Like, they're not technically legal, even though they're Except for Oregon, decriminalized. I guess. Yeah, go Oregon. Yeah, right? Everything. I guess we should have some. Uh, <laughs> Some riots in the downtown area. We should Ooh. up our rioting game. Maybe we'll get everything decriminalized. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> uh, no offense, Portland, Oregon. I, I love your state, and specifically uh, Portland. Portland. Mm -hmm. And I love what they're doing out there. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, it's, it's, we're making beautiful drugs. We're mm -hmm. making, we're helping ourselves psychologically, um, especially in the midst of COVID, which I know we've talked. It's, uh, it's not the easiest time to, to cope with anything, with life. Right. So if I can give my mind a little bit of a tweak, a yeah. little bit of a, a break with some psilocybin, some mushrooms, 
God, that's amazing. Yeah, throw a little nature in there, throw and then nature. all of a sudden it's a magical weekend. Plus, you're putting your you're like you're putting your brand. I fucking created this. This is mine. Yeah, I did this soup to nuts. There's just that added um, bliss associated with that. Absolutely. We <laughs> were talking about that before the podcast, just w- with respect to hunting, even right. Hunting, it's yeah. That just added, you know, being able to create it yourself. You're engaged in the entire process. It just it gives you a lot more fulfillment, and then when you get to share it with other people, it's even more of an excitement, and then other people get excited about it, and then they slowly go on a journey, and you get to watch it. It's it's fun. Exactly. Like when you see somebody eat your mushrooms and have a great time, it's like you cooked a major meal, and somebody, they love your amount of salt and uh, just the, the right amount of searing on the uh, the entree. That's how, that's the feeling you get when yeah. somebody else gets super jacked off your drugs. Absolutely. I hate to call them drugs because they're really theogens, like yeah. Michael Pollan calls them theogens, but they're still technically legally drugs. Yeah. But they're great drugs. Yeah. Great drugs. Absolutely. Top of my list. Oh, for sure. <laughs> for sure. And we make them. Yeah. Back to the uh, back to the whole making it thing. Let's talk about Spawn. So, okay. Uh, and Brody's running around. Uh, Mook is the cat. Brody's the dog. They're chasing each other. Um, I promise that's not the furnace in the background. <laughs> One of the multitude of distractions in the basement of the podcast studio. Um, so back to cultivation. So with Spawn, we talked about in the last episode, and, and Chris, you and I talked uh, oat, rye. Those are some of the more popular grains to be okay. used for Spawn. Now that, when we talk about that, that's the bulk growing method. Like mm-hmm. the PF Tech, the cake ba- base method, like the beginner method. Yes. The one that you tried initially. And uh, failed. Well, <laughs> <laughs> but you still had a little bit, right? Yeah. It wasn't you got like a, a couple mushrooms I out did. of it. Okay, I, no mushrooms, but oh, no I did mushrooms. get the. I did at least get some mycelia populating. That so wasn't it covered was in failure. other mold. Okay, all right. Um, <laughs> I think it took me a few times, even with the cakes initially, to get anything worthwhile. So uh, I don't think that's uncommon. Yeah, but you're resilient. See, so you, you bounce back. Um, and PF Tech. When we talk about PF Tech, like if you do your research online and you look uh, at the blogs and whatnot, everybody will kind of steer you back to PF Tech to start off with. Okay. Um, you basically take some wide mouth mason jars. You take a mixture of brown rice uh, flour and vermiculite and some water. You mix it up and you fill these jars. Um, and basically, those are kind of like, kind of like our spawn. It's a different type of substrate breeding ground for the mycelium. Um, I don't know the I don't know the difference in terms of like which one's more nutritious or uh, if it's like sugar content. Yeah, or like why oats over. Right, I don't uh, know the no. periodic table, so yeah. like there's going to be some gaps in my knowledge. <laughs> but uh, the PF Tech method has that vermiculite brown rice flour water combo in the jars. Those ultimately become your cakes. Mm-hmm. So you sterilize those. Um, if you're not familiar with the sterilization process, pressure cooker is the way to go. Right. Some people will use like a pot and use steam, which is what I did, did and not as not as easy. So unfortunately, the pressure cookers not they're kind of expensive. Uh, a pre- a twenty three quart pressure cooker like the one I have is about one hundred and thirty hundred and fifty bucks. Gotcha. Um, and with a twenty three quart pressure cooker, you can fit like eight uh, thirty two ounce jars. Okay. Yeah, I mean that's a lot. Two, there'd be like six on the base, and then mm-hmm. two lying down on the uh, second tier. Gotcha. So I mean, you can sterilize quite a bit, but you know, 150 bucks—that's a decent investment. Yep. The smaller uh, pressure cookers, the ones that can store like the just a couple jars at a time, and get those for like 40 or 50 bucks. But depends on how active you are with the sure. hobby. Right. Um, so you want to sterilize. So uh, with the cakes. I think I can't remember exactly what the sterilization time was. I think it was ninety minutes at fifteen psi. Something like that's that. That's pretty standard. Mm-hmm. Uh, psi is uh, pressure, but pounds per square inch. Yeah, uh, there you yeah. go. <laughs> uh, man, I almost went off the edge there. So pounds per square inch, um, and fifteen psi is kind of the level where the sterilization takes place. It just needs to happen for a certain period of time to guarantee that everything is fully decontaminated. Um, go ahead. It's essentially pasteurization, right? Yeah, no, I only know pasteurization in like a um, a submerging context, like gotcha. uh, you do with the substrate, the sure. casing, mm-hmm. or you do with milk. But maybe, yeah, adding heat to reduce the contamination, I guess, yep. essentially is pasteurization. I think so. So we're pasteurizing using a pressure cooker. Some of the more industrial shops will use like these huge vat pressure cooker things, which probably more than one hundred and fifty dollars. I would imagine. But nonetheless, you put your 
your cakes or uh, the spawn. In this case, we're talking about the PF Tech cakes. You put those in your pressure cooker for 90 minutes. Um, <laughs> hey, Brody, uh, I'm, I'm doing a podcast, buddy. All right, thanks. You put those in there for 90 minutes. You put some foil on top of them to make sure that they don't get uh, submerged with water. And then they're sterile and ready for the next phase. Now, pivoting to spawn. Go ahead. You inoculate with the spores before you pressure cook, correct? No. no. Okay. After. All right. So the preparatory phases, good question, by the way. Yeah. The preparatory phases would be to create your PF Tech cakes or your spawn, um, create them and sterilize them before doing anything with spores, mycelium, liquid culture, any of that stuff. That does make sense. And they can live in that sterilized state for a while. Okay. So, like, let's say you wanted to create some jars, uh, some PF Tech jars or some spawn, and you just wanted to let them sit for a few months. Mm -hmm. You could actually do that post-pressure cooker um, and just let them sit, and they'll be fine until you're ready to inoculate. Now, if you let them sit with the spawn before you sterilize, they've had a lot of issues where they get moldy and kind of become unusable. Makes sense. Okay. Um, so that's just kind of like a, you know, you learn learning uh, throughout the process over time. Sure. So PF Tech, if you do that, uh, you can find uh, it's PFTEK online somewhere if you want to do the cakes. Sure. I, at this point, Chris, you, we're in the bulk phase. Like, we want some major harvest. Like, if you're going to buy a TV, buy the fucking 80-inch TV. Don't, don't get the 50 so and try to like justify it. It's $30 more than the smaller one anyway. At this, in this economy, you can get a good deal on an 80-inch. Yeah. Go the 80 inches. Uh, 50's great, 50's great, but it's not 80. And if you have the capacity to go 80, no male in on this earth will question it. I think you're right. So as a man, yes, we're going bulk harvest. With the bulk harvest, you start with something called spawn. And Chris and I, you and I have been using rye as our spawn. Yes, so, and, and this was an area where you helped me out on my first grow this way. Um, you're welcome. And we're... Thank you, sir. <laughs> and gave me some of the rye spawn. So I, uh, can you tell me a little bit more about how you prepare the, the rye for it since I'm yeah. wanting to, you know, take yeah. another run at it and maybe try bags? Yeah, and I – so on the last episode, I touched on it a little bit, but um, I've used rye grain exclusively, but I've talked to some other people that use oat. Um, some people have used millet and some other seeds. I, I don't have any direct experience with that. Um, but what I do is I get rye – uh, organic rye berries, they call them. That's like the rye seed. Right. You can get those on Amazon or a lot of different like feed places. So I buy the rye berries. I think I bought like 25 pounds. And you take those rye berries and you put them in a bucket, like a Home Depot, uh, you know. Five gallon. Yeah, the yep. orange bucket. Yep. So you put your rye berries in the bucket. You put um, – and you rinse them out like you would any kind of grain. You rinse them out maybe four or five times, kind of get the dirt off the outside of those grains. Right. So the water kind of runs as clear as possible through the strainer, right? You've done this before, yes. Oh, with rice I cooked recently. Well, that's that's practical <laughs> experience right there. So, yes, exactly what, what uh, Chris said. When it's clear, you take one more. Um, you you cover up the, uh, the grain and water. Uh, I usually leave maybe four to five extra inches of water above where it's covered. You add one coffee cup worth of coffee for some acidity. I don't know, again, the scientific Sweet. reasoning behind that, but several mycology aficionados and experts have said you need the acidity to help with some of the growth. Don't know. I've been using it almost religiously. All right. So you add one cup of coffee, um, and then you also add about a cup of gypsum, which is that plaster of Paris, which people say doesn't really help with the nourishment or anything like that just kind of helps the grains stay separate. So you add a cup of gypsum, That's plaster of Paris. Gotcha. All you right. add a cup of coffee, and you add enough water to cover up your grain by like four or five inches. And I usually use like half of the 25-pound the bag with one batch. And that'll give me a good like dozen and a half jars. Okay. So and you go with large jars. Next question. So with that, with the rinsing of the grain, with the soaking of the grain, once you create that concoction of gypsum, coffee, and water, and your rye um, berries, sure, you take that, you cover it up. I use like um, saran wrap, uh, could be anything. Just just cover it up and let it sit overnight. You basically want to let it let the rye berries soak up that solution. Once it's fully, like once it's been like overnight or twelve hours, could be I think up to a day. You just want to let them absorb that water. Okay. Then you take them and you put them on the stove. 
And you put them on the stove and you let them simmer for like 15, 20 minutes. Just the last ingestion of water. You want these things totally hydrated. Okay. Once it's been simmering for about 20 minutes, you take it off the stove and then you, um, you dry off the rye berries. So what I do, you can put them in a strainer and kind of like shake them around. Um, but I'll take, I take a piece of screen and I roll the piece of screen out. Um, I clip it on a couple different storage bins. I kind of roll it out flat, suspend it over um, maybe like you know two or three feet over the surface so that I have an aerated area underneath them to dry out. Mm-hmm. And I'll spread all the rye berries wet out over that, that uh, screen. Okay. You let them dry. They don't have to dry completely. You just want to let some of that water seep mm-hmm. off. Once they're kind of dry, then you take them and you put them in uh, mason jars. I've been using the 32 ounce, like the uh, that's the quart size jar. Right. Definitely wide mouth. If you don't use wide mouth, it's gonna be a bitch getting the mycelium, the, the spawn out of the jar when it's time to mix with right. the casing. Which still, even with the the <laughs> tiny little neck on it, it was still a little bit of a little bit of a challenge. Yeah. Why add? We talked about it. It's a cumbersome process yeah. all, for for good reason, but right. we don't want to make it any harder. Yeah. So you get the the little tiny jars, and they have no neck. It's great. But I don't know that they do no neck thirty two ounce jars. As long as it's a wide neck, you right. want it to be just wide, just super. <laughs> Remember those? Uh, no, you probably don't. In the in the eighties, I'm an old, I'm much older. In the eighties, they had these uh, these shirts that I think they were called body glove or something like body glove or something like that. Just extremely wide neck. Oh, they went yeah. well with like uh, one of those leather weightlifting belts and sure. like some uh, some gray sweatpants. Mm-hmm. That yeah. sort of look, Absolutely. just an extremely open neck. Like you can see every trap all the way down to like the 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 uh, side of the deltoid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just like a little like the Madonna like slant, but on both sides. Absolutely, far enough out where if you had an AC tear, you'd, you'd still see it. Right, just like barely hanging on. Hey, chicks dig scars, right? Yeah. So show both show both shoulders with the scars. <laughs> um, so I don't even know where I was going with that. Uh, oh, wide mouth. Wide mouth yeah. jars. So do not buy any th- – the regular mouth jars, I don't care if they're on sale. I don't know if somebody tells you you'll be fine. Do not make it harder on yourself. Go wide mouth. Right. Right. Uh, like a hooker. If, you want, if, you're buying a, if you're getting a hooker, renting a hooker. You're spending the money already. If you're spending the money already, wide mouth. Yep. Don't shortchange it. Don't make it t- – I mean, there's teeth in there, so Ooh. why fuck around? All right. Yeah. Um, so, yes, wide mouth jars. I do the quart. I want to fill them like three quarters of the way full. Okay. Don't want to fill them all the way because they need a little bit of area to breathe, and just three quarters is the standard. Um, you fill them up and you seal off the jars. Um, now, when you're making those jars, like you can find the uh, the uh, instructions online. Usually, you create the jars with like a uh, syringe. Um, what's that called? Self healing injection port. And do you find those just in bulk somewhere on yeah. Amazon? For or? like a hundred, you can get like a hundred for I think less than ten bucks. And then you just have a standard size hole that you put in the top. Yeah, there's I don't know the exact diameter. Um, I mean, when you look at it, you can see what that drill bit should look like. But if you drill into the top of your mason jar, uh, the self healing injection port injection port just kind of like pops in there. Um, and I usually take some gasket maker silicone and just kind of seal it up just to make sure that it, there's no holes or anything right. between the um, injection port and the, the lid. And I think, so when I first inoculated the jars that I did, um, the the kind of little cakes, yeah. instead of using a self-injection port, I had holes drilled in the top and injected through there and then covered it with micropore tape, right. but more of an opportunity for um, other molds and things to get in there. Yeah, see, the which is what I ran into. And yeah, I mean, everybody, like I was telling you, I get a 60 40 split mm-hmm. the way I'm doing it now using a still air box uh, between usable and non usable um, spawn. Sure. Um, yeah. I think if I had a laminar flow hood, which I talked a little bit about in the last episode, that is the like coup de gras of decontamination uh, command centers for the mycologist. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you're looking at several hundred dollars worth of investment, which right. at some point, if we keep this going, Chris, we're going to have to figure something out to get a flow hood going. Absolutely. But for the short term, still airbox, you're looking at like a $15 investment versus maybe a $500 investment. So, right. uh, the Jewish part of me comes out immediately there and says, Hey, 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 let's, let's chill with the $15 investment just for the, the short term. Absolutely. Yeah. Like as a parent, you tell your kid, hey, make sure you really like it before you buy the whole outfit uh-huh. and the helmet. Uh, yeah, all that fancy uh-huh. stuff. 
So, yes, the self-healing injector port, which the best part about that that I found, and you will find as well, if we use the liquid culture, which we haven't talked about, it creates a much, much more sterile environment, less susceptible to contamination because you're exactly. really not exposing anything. Right. You're going right through the injector port. You don't have to open up the, the jar. I think long term, that's where that's going to be the sweet spot. Mm -hmm. But, you know, all the stuff that leading up leading up to that is a big pain in the ass. Yeah. So self-healing injector port and also the air exchange. Uh, FAE, that is the um, the acronym that I see everywhere, fresh air exchange. Whenever you see FAE uh, with nerding out online, looking at shroom stuff, it's fresh air exchange. All right. So you have to have something whenever you're growing mycelium for fresh air exchange because the CO2 and the oxygen, there has to be a distribution of the two. Makes sense. If it's all CO2, your mushrooms are going to... Uh, they're going to die. Right. I'm not saying, I mean, they may grow up all fucked up. You don't want that. You don't want that for your kids. No. And, and when you get into mushrooms, they're kind of your kids. Yeah. 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 You I wake up in the morning, make sure they're out. okay. Mm -hmm. You know, do you take the covers off? Just make sure it might, re you know, sing them a lullaby. I don't know. Right. Take pictures. Yeah. Send them to friends. <laughs> Look at how big they got today. <laughs> it's my fucking background. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't you tell me you were like waking up excited in the morning to see your yeah. harvest? <laughs> I had a friend watch them over the weekend while I was uh, down in Texas. And every day I was like, hey, man, can you send me a picture of the box? <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. You're like a soldier overseas. <laughs> like, I want to see my family. Right. Um, <laughs> how excited was the friend to look after your mushrooms? Uh, at first, he thought he would screw it up. Yeah. But it's once you get to that phase in it, it's pretty hard to screw up. I mean, Good you, point. you pluck them at the time you think is closest to the right time, and if you right. miss it, oh no! You yeah, I might be fucking anyways. pissed when I get back, but that's yeah. just the way it is. Yeah, I, you know that reminds me of looking after somebody's stuff. Did you ever see the movie uh, Road Trip with um, Tom uh, Green? Oh, absolutely. Looking after Mitch. Oh God! <laughs> right? Yeah, uh, I would. I would still let Tom Green look after my mushrooms, even though I would know it would be a disaster. But mm -hmm. uh, Mitch. So, yeah, um, back to the spawn. So the fresh air exchange, you can just use some polyfill, which – do you have your polyfill bag? I uh, haven't needed to get one. You gave me maybe a fist size of it. Yeah. It was enough for two boxes. But uh, Bijou keeps tearing up toys around the house, so I can just pull it right <laughs> out, of the, out of the stuffed <laughs> animal. More polyfill. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's uh, – so B, she's trying to help. I yeah. mean, yeah, Bijou's your, your dog. Um, probably won't make an appearance on this podcast. Probably, probably not. Probably won't. Um, but, but the whole family's anyway. chipping in. That's really the point. You know? She understands the importance <laughs> of mushrooms to daddy. Mm -hmm. She's helped me. Mm -hmm. So the uh, polyfill, just as Chris said, is the inside of your dog's toy. It's that fluffy stuff inside of a pillow. Um, if you like separate it apart, apart with your hands, it's kind of like cotton candy. Um, and that is the best medium for fresh air exchange. So in your monotubs, which we haven't talked about monotub construct yet, but in your monotubs, in your jars, um, you're always going to use your polyfill for fresh air exchange. Right. So you're building a bear, but mm -hmm. it's not just a, it's not a bear. It's, it's, it's mushroom accessories. Um, but if you do want to build a bear, you can also use that same plumbing for the inside of your bear. Which <laughs> might also be fun to do <laughs> while enjoying what you just grew. Oh, man. Yeah, build a bear on, under the influence. It's going to be a fucking awesome be a lot bear. of fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, so fresh air exchange. And um, yeah, just keep that in mind. Wherever you store your jars, wherever you store anything that is kind of breeding mycelium, you definitely have to give it a little bit of a buffer. So mm -hmm. don't have like a book sitting right on top of your jar or whatever. You need to have a little bit of buffer for that fresh air exchange. So create those jars. You sterilize, sterilize those jars in your pressure cooker, and then you are ready to inoculate those jars really whenever you want. And let them cool down a little bit. Don't, don't jump right into it like minute one. Give them maybe like 10 hours to cool down. Right. Does that, does that fill in the gaps? How do you feel about your spawn knowledge? Like if you were to start from scratch at this point, how do you feel about spawn? Well, I have the recipe and, I, uh, and the steps. I think, I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, and after watching a few videos with people doing that process uh, and leveraging the bags, and you end up with kind of a brick of your yes. mycelia things, it, it seems like a great process. So I think outside of another shot at overly automating my tubs like yours are, I think the, the bags in that process might be an interesting way to go. I totally agree. And I want to follow up. Um, we talked about the jars, but what Qu Chris was referring to is there are these um, – Myco bags, they're mushroom bags that are 
I think they're either three pounds or five pounds. The one I have are five pounds. Um, and so you fill them with your spawn the same way you would your jars, but it's just a bigger container, mm -hmm. a little bit different for air exchange. Um, but then you can actually grow right inside the bag. So I haven't done that yet. We talked about it, um, introducing some some substrate in there with the spawn to grow right inside the bag. But we haven't got to that experiment. So I do want to like discuss and kind of walk through that experiment at some point down the road. Yeah. That'd be pretty awesome. Absolutely. Oh, this stuff. It's so vast. It's just a vast world of fun stuff. Easy to get into it. And the people online, you talked about like resources and stuff. The people online, um, no offense to any of those people, but they don't look like scientists, right? I mean, these guys, they look, you shouldn't judge a book by its cover, it's, sure. but it's hard. I mean, we all we all like to judge, especially on the internet. It's, sure. it's a judgy place. Look, when you see Where's Waldo on the cover, though, you know it's not going to be a good read, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a really good point. Um, so they're not, they don't look like scholars. They don't look like, you know, they shared a class with Barack Obama in, in college. Like, probably not that, but they fucking know mushrooms. And there's nothing more fun than listening to someone who is incredibly passionate about whatever it is they're talking about. Oh, and, and a guy with a super neck beard just talking with, like, MIT-level knowledge. Right. That is just impressive. Mm -hmm. It's like, sir, you haven't showered, but you've read a lot of books. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, so if you look online, don't be scared by their sketchy appearance. Um, they know what they're talking about, especially if they're sitting in front of a laminar flow hood. They put some money into this. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Sounds like a good time to interrupt and provide you with a health segment from Wifey Jill. Here we go. This is the first installment of a new segment that I don't have a name for. We'll figure out a name. But it involves my wife, Jill, and it involves the health and nutritional aspects of mushrooms and mycology. Um, they, uh, they've been around as a tasty treat for a long time. However, there's a ton of different health benefits and a lot of things they're discovering as they continue to explore, um, you know, what mushrooms and fungus bring to the table, um, just in so many different ways. But anyways, the wifey, uh, her name is Jill and she's an expert in the field. I'd like to introduce you to her. Um, first installment, so the first installment of this new segment, Jill, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing well. I mean, I wouldn't say expert quite yet, but studying to be one. Well, you're humble. I mean, you can self-proclaimed expert. We, uh, this, <laughs> this household proclaims you as the okay. health expert. All right, I'll take it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As soon to be very credentialed, so it's a you know, work in progress. Yeah, working towards it. So we're going to pick a different mushroom each week or each installment of the podcast and just kind of profile the mushroom and talk about it from your um, expert perspective, what it can bring to the table, and just what the scientists and the community uh, is saying about that particular strain. So this week, um, I'll let you introduce that mushroom, and we can start talking about it. Wifey Jill. Yeah, so we are going to speak about the uh, lion's mane mushroom. Um, so this one in recent years has really gained popularity, um, especially amongst, you know, vegans, vegetarians, because there are a lot of health benefits, uh, vitamins and minerals that are associated with it. Um, so yeah, it, it gained popularity mostly in Asian countries, China, India, Japan, and Korea. Um, it's a mushroom that can be enjoyed raw, cooked, dried, or steeped in tea. Um, and the extracts often used um, can also be found in over-the-counter health supplements. Mm. And I remember recently you made a dish that was awesome that contained lion's mane mushroom. Um, what, uh, what was that dish? Yeah, so lion's mane has a flavor um, that's very seafood-like. Um, so something like lobster, crab, um, that's kind of the flavor profile that it provides. So we had made some crab cakes uh, from the mushrooms. Awesome. And uh, yeah, those... I mean, it wasn't exactly like crab, but I mean, for something that uh, you can go either buy at the store or grow yourself, they have, you know, grow kits and things where you can grow at home lion's mane. It's kind of cool to be able to simulate that taste a little bit. What did you think of the crab cakes? I mean, I personally liked it. It was my first time preparing it, and it was just by one recipe. So, you know, you, with every recipe, you kind of find the way you like it to be prepared, and um, maybe you cook it a little longer, maybe you... Uh, marinated a little longer um, beforehand. So I definitely think for a first try, it was successful. Um, and something unique about it too, if, if you haven't seen one before, you know, Google an image. Um, it literally looks like a lion's mane. It has um, little hairs, if you will. Um, it's white. Um, so it's very, very different from any mushroom you might have thought of in the past. 
did you ever play with Play-Doh growing up? Absolutely. And there, well, you put Play-Doh inside like a head and then you would squeeze it and the hair would come out the top. Yes. That's kind of the shape I would say it looks like. It, yeah. I, it's one of the prettier mushrooms, I believe. The, uh, the lion's mane mushroom contains bio bioactive substances um, that have been shown to have beneficial effects on the body, um, but especially for the brain, heart, and gut. Um, so gut health is really taken off in recent years. Um, so, you know, keeping a happy gut is ke kind of keeping a whole happy body. Um, wait, but wait, then wait, the on. So when you say gut, I mean, that sounds... It sounds so eloquent. <laughs> Keeping a happy gut. <laughs> yeah, um, probiotics, flora, prebiotics. Um, you know, your gut is, you know, what, and when I say gut, I'm talking about your intestines, small intestines, large intestines, um, basically where the food in your body hang out the longest. Okay. Um, so food is only in your stomach for two hours, um, but it can be in your gut anywhere from 10 hours to multiple days. Um, so if it's, if food is, hanging out in there and it's maybe not the good type of foods, um, let's say cakes and donuts and all that stuff, um, that's going to affect your gut flora um, essentially and breaking down those um, materials and really harboring any type of nutrients from it. Um, I mean, we could really, you know, dive deep into that and I want to learn more personally about that. Sure. Um, but yeah, gut health is something that um, if you take a lot of antibiotics, you're killing off that gut, mm. um, the, the microflora in there. So You're not killing off the gut. Like, it's not a way to lose weight. You don't take antibiotics to lose weight. No, no, no. That's just a fight disease. kill off your, your, your beer gut. Um, but, yeah, you have a lot of good bacteria in your body. I'm um, like millions. I mean, I want to say millions. I don't know that for a fact. Um, but I want to say upwards of millions of bacteria, different types of bacteria, um, that work harm harmoniously um, to kind of keep you um, in, a, in a healthy condition. Okay. Yeah, and probiotics are all the rage. Like, I, I yeah. take them just because I heard they were good. Um, I don't know a lot of the science like like you do. I Like, when I think of gut, I think of something protruding from someone's uh, waistband. Oh, no, no, you got to think internal. <laughs> right, right. So, <laughs> so the gut is, uh, it's a good thing to have good stuff in your gut, right? Yeah, you want a healthy gut. Healthy gut. Um, and if you have the beer gut, you can still have a healthy gut inside the beer gut yeah. if you take probiotics and, in this case, make some uh, some lion's mane uh, Yeast is good for the gut. So I don't know if that's scientific, scientifically proven that beer is good for the gut, but, um, you know, yeast is a bacteria. So, I mean, maybe. Now, We've uh, we've talked in the previous episode, Folgers getting in on all the mushroom hype. They have a lion's mane um, variety of their their coffee. We are a Folgers household. We like we have not had that version though. We have not had that version. I think it's not mainstream quite yet. It's just kind of budding, um, but it's kind of cool that Folgers. Hey, um, not only can you wake up to a great cup of our coffee, but it, you can also feed the brain and head off uh, dementia as you go about it. Yeah, so dementia is is one of the um, the health benefits of, of lion's mane with its you know brain vitality um, because the brain's ability to grow and form new connections declines with age. Um, so when we're talking about mental health and as we get older, um, anything we can do to you know stay as sharp as possible, sure. um, especially in a healthy in a healthy way by just consuming a different type of food, um, you know can add that cognitive, um, you know expenditure if you will yeah no i like that and when you said it dementia is a benefit avoiding dementia we want to avoiding yeah, it. yeah mitigating Correct. dementia um i take lexapro and one of the things that they tout lexapro as is something that can help ward off dementia as you get older um, because it stimulates parts of the brain i guess that like you said need to be more active so if you can just take a delicious uh, culinary component or some sort of uh pill that contains lion's mane extract it sounds like an easy win. Um, none of us want dementia. I mean, sometimes if you ha if we have a bad day, we want temporary dementia, but nothing that we want to last. So uh, hip, hip, hooray to lion's mane. Yeah, so there are two special compounds that are found in lion's mane um, that help stimulate the growth of brain cells. Um, so we're talking about herosinones and then oracerines. Um, so forgive me on the pronunciation there. Um, but both of those have been proven to stimulate growth of brain, uh, brain cells. Um, and then other astra um, extracts have been shown to reduce symptoms of memory loss in mice um, that are caused by amyl amyloid and beta plaques. 
um, which can accumulate in the brain during Alzheimer's. Um, so we're not just talking dementia, we're talking Alzheimer's, um, you know, and any other just degenerative um, neural, neural decrease. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And, you know, there's, nowadays, there's the, uh, the quick to prescribe some sort of pharmaceutical to resolve everything. But my gosh, if you can find a way with th something that grows out of the ground, um, something that's completely organic and natural, like lion's mane mushroom. And like we, like I said, beautiful, beautiful thing. It was presented. And tasty. And tasty. And it's, I think this is a, an opportunity for you to judge a book by its cover. It's beautiful on the inside and outside. Hip, hip. Hooray. <laughs> um, Jill, I really appreciate you being on this episode, and hopefully you'll come back. Yeah. No, I think mushrooms are kind of a, a new age, um, you know, homeopathic you know, type of, of food that we can do use to treat and prevent disease in our body. And we're so early on, you know, finding out all the benefits of that. Um, so not just from a psychedelic perspective with dealing with, um, you know, disorders on that end of the spectrum, but, sure. um, you know, other ones from, you know, treating cancer patients and, um, you know, a, a mild depression, it can treat that as well. So I just think that they're, the world is really our oyster mushroom um, <laughs> when it comes to when it comes to the species. Awesome. I completely agree, and I love you both on the podcast and off. Ah, um, love you back. Thank you very much. So, listeners, I expect more of Wifey Jill, the health dietary uh, expert. Um, thank you, Jill, and uh, I'll see you soon. Cheers. And boom, hopefully you found that entertaining. And now back to our discussion on spawn. So the spawn, yeah, that is, and I, I think when you get like past that point when everything's sterile and you're ready for the next phase, like if you've done your homework at that point, like you're close. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about the 60-40 split for me. What did you say, your ratio of good to bad? So in that first batch that um, I did not have a fume hood, I was very, I wasn't nearly as clean as I should have been. Okay. I had... Six out of eight jars fail and okay. had two jars make it through to a point where, and some of them failed right away. Some of them failed on day 10, 11, 12. Gotcha. And then I was down to two jars from there. Okay. So and pretty bad split the first time. Yeah. I mean, you kind of learn too. Uh, mm -hmm. For me, you know, I found that uh, I was shaking the jars too much early on and I stunted their growth. Mm. And like I had the lid off too long when I was introducing auger. So, like, you kind of remember in your head, like, oh, I kind of fucked up. So hopefully at some point we'll be at, like, 100% efficiency rate. No. I don't know if that's possible, though. That's well, close to possible. Laminar flow hood. Yeah. yeah. I'm God, just right? selling that to the wifey. <laughs> it's happening. Um, so I, I won't go past that phase um, for today. I think that's a, a good place to start. Um, you will also notice the pressure cooker will come in handy when we talk about liquid culture. Um, the recipe for liquid culture, mm -hmm. it's, it's really, really easy. Um, okay. So I, I know people, when they think of, like, mycelium suspended in liquid sugar, it's like, whoa, it's, it's really easy and really cool. So when we do that episode, I definitely um, I think you'll be surprised at the level of ease uh, to making that work. Awesome. Um, what else did I have that I wanted to talk about? Talk about psychedelics. Uh, I want to talk about your take on psychedelics, um, just as, like, a, a peer, somebody that, that like, just appreciates the, the genre um, of explorative – Explorative science? Yeah. What, uh, like, what's your take on, on psychedelics? Man. Obviously, they're my favorite um, out of any of the, the drugs that I've tried. I think the first time I took a psychedelic, I had no idea what to expect, really. Um, but, man, it's – you feel connected. You feel yeah. compassionate. You feel appreciative. And I think those are things that are super important for us to feel all the time, right? It's how you – have a shitty day and pull yourself out of it is being appreciative for stuff. Absolutely. So it helps a lot with that. Um, and in nature, I mean, you just feel so connected to the people you're with and to the people or to the nature that you're in. So, I, I mean, it's really easy to view it a lot like a medicine, uh, which you'll hear a lot when you go see videos and things online or watch fantastic fungi or fungi or whatever they're calling it. No doubt. Man. Um, totally. So, uh, and then it also sparks the interest to continue to explore. At least it did for myself and my girlfriend. And um, to the point where growing was part of that exploration, to the point where reading books yeah. is part of that exploration, to the point uh, where 
taking higher doses in more of a medical situation, more of a uh, counseling type of situation for mental health um, is, is on the agenda as well. So it's it's really really easy to get absorbed. Totally, man. Yeah, yeah. I I empathize with that. And I I remember you came to me. We met a couple of years ago, something like that. Yeah, and we I don't know how it brought what came up, uh, but uh, I saw like the 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 light in your eyes when I mentioned that I was growing mushrooms. Yeah, and, uh, it's that's what it does to you. It's a, it just uh, this this interesting area of like never ending exploration sure and there's so there, there's something about being able to share that yeah and being able to like then see someone else's journey with it oh, and great. the cool thing about it too is like if you really like once you get into it you respect it it's like mm -hmm. you know i do jujitsu i respect the art of jujitsu i respect right. it i would never disrespect it i would never trivialize it I would never do anything to take away from the people that really have taken the time to understand it and embrace it and share that wisdom with others. Absolutely. So I treat psychedelics the same way. It's like I don't want to disrespect it. I don't want to disrespect the experience. I want to have intentions going into it, all that stuff. Yeah. Um, because if you don't, if you treat it frivolously mm -hmm. or you don't respect the process, um, it can make your life miserable. Like, I mean, I don't know if you've had any of those experiences, but that is the opposite of everything good that you just mentioned. I have not had that experience. Wait, let me interject. That's one of the other uh, audio distractions, the toilet rushing from above. Oh. Uh, again, I didn't intentionally position my podcast studio next to the toilet uh, water. Huh. But um, So just for the listening audience, and I guess, again, I hope it's vast, uh, that's running toilet water. <laughs> Back to you. Uh, lost my train of thought. So you were talking about, um, we were saying, like, respect it, uh, the intention, setting your intentions. Oh, right. So I... Um I ran into an experience with a friend of mine who had a, we were both enjoying mushrooms um, uh, with a few people and I think watching Avatar and his experience turned him off of wanting to do mushrooms again. Really? It wasn't incredibly negative. It wasn't uh, an incredibly bad trip, but his experience with it, with everything that was going on in his life, he was like, you know, this, this maybe isn't for me. Yeah, wrong setting. Yeah, and that's something that I hear a lot about. And when reading books about maybe taking a larger dose in kind of a mental health capacity, that set and setting is incredibly important, making sure that you're in the right mental space for it, making sure you have the time to approach it with the right mindset and leave with the right mindset and someone to talk to about the experience afterwards. I mean, all of those things, from what I hear, play into it. No doubt. And you mentioned um, integration, the yes. discussion afterwards. Dude, I mean, if you do it in a therapeutic sense, mm -hmm. I mean, if you just do it to have some fun and, you know, it's it's a warm, like, uh, non-threatening environment, that's totally cool. Right. But if you do it in a therapeutic, almost like medicinal therapeutic sense, mm -hmm. um, the integration is key. Like, talking right. about your experience, having other people kind of explain that to you. Um, when I did ayahuasca, the integration part was paramount. I bet. Um, so I could totally see with mushrooms that integration being equally as important if that's your goal, is to get some healing out of it. Absolutely. Do you think that the integration helps you kind of solidify consciously what you just experienced in a kind of semi-subconscious but also conscious state? Yeah, I think I think some of that. Um and also, I mean, you need some legitimacy. Like, people are super vulnerable when, you know, these profound things happen to them. Right. And for the people listening that have never taken psychedelics, depending on the strength, um, you know, the dosage you take, depending on the setting, de depending on, you know, what natural resources are around that could affect you, depending on all those factors, um, you might have a super impactful, super powerful experience. And if you do, you need somebody to kind of, like, reconcile that for you. You need somebody to kind of... Um, allow you to to fully be vulnerable and explain it. And I think that, to me, like with integration is the best part. If you're willing to, you know, like with mushrooms, you have to totally give into it. If you don't yep. totally give in, it kind of sucks. Right. Integration is the same thing. If you don't totally give into the integration, you're really not allowing it to fully come full circle in the healing process. Makes sense. This is my, you know, yeah. perspective. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, at some point I would love to, like, do that sort of thing with integrations and not shaman, but similar types of right. Because seeing people's minds flip and seeing their uh, their ideologies change and just better themselves through that sort of experience, I mean, that's an invaluable experience. 
Absolutely. And I think that we're in an interesting spot with society right now where more and more conversations around that are being acceptable. And you can attribute that to things like this, right? People having the ability to communicate in long form and actually discuss ideas and have differing point of views and things like that. But we're at a place where people are finally kind of looking past the Reagan administration's uh, drug <laughs> views yeah. and, and going, you know, we were getting places with this as a medicine and we have so many problems with mental health, with addiction, with PTSD, with things like that. And there are unique applications of psychedelics that help in those situations. And we knew this in the 60s. And then we just put a huge halt to it. You're right, man. And, you know, some... And back then, you know, with uh, the Nixon administration and some of those people that really spearheaded the the war on drugs, mm -hmm. Reagan perpetuated it <laughs> more than we could possibly imagine. But... Um, yeah, they just didn't have enough information. And unfortunately, religion has not been very kind to substances. I mean, Eastern medicine, absolutely. But Western medicine, if it's not pharmacologically, what is it, pharmaceutically, pharmaceutically created, created yeah. then they don't want to hear about it. And that's kind of, that's really upsetting because those are the most harmful drugs. Now, there's one category of drugs, the meth, crack, uh, uh, heroin category, like right. that's... That's a different story. So that category of recreational drugs, sorry, Oregon, that category, uh, that's in a completely separate category. Pharmaceutical drugs and the meth, heroin, crack category, those are really harmful drugs. Mushrooms, weed, peyote, shit like that, I mean, those are not harmful. They may suck. You know, you may have a bad psychological experience, mm -hmm. but you're not going to blow up your heart or shatter your liver or, you right. know, other things you can get from those other drugs. I absolutely agree. The uh, I, For anybody who's even considering something like it or just kind of fooling around with the idea but has heard a lot of negative press about it from, you know, 40s, 50s, or sorry, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. Yeah. Um, man, the what was the Netflix show that they did? Was it Have a Good Trip? Oh, did that was that the one where people explain their yeah. experiences? And it was a lot of people who are in very creative roles Sting. in Hollywood and in the music industry and in tech talking about the positive and negative sides of experiences that they've had. And you know, it's eye opening to to hear those people that you look up to or you respect or you dig their music or you, you like the work they're doing, you know, in Silicon Valley and to hear them really open up about it. It kinda takes a little bit of the mystique away from it and a little bit of the I don't know. I don't want to say fear. It's not the right word, but I can't think of the right one. <laughs> no, I, I agree. Like it, it humanizes. Stigma. There it is. Yeah, it humanizes them, and it and it, and it, it humanizes the experience. Like, right. Because you know, if you don't have any intimacy with it, if you have no direct experience, it's all rhetoric. It's all hearsay. So you know, it makes it a little bit more humanized, and because it's somebody, Brody. <laughs> Again, I, I did mention Brody would have unsolicited uh, commentary. Um, and he stopped. It's so better than the gas. I so. did whenever I did. <laughs> um, so, uh, man, I lost my train of thought again. Anyway, uh, yes. It, it humanizes the experience. It yes. makes it more attainable, and it takes a little bit of the stigma away from it. I think that no one should approach it just willy-nilly. Nobody should just be like, hey, like, you want to try it? Heck yeah. <laughs> like, you should, you should think about it a little bit. You should do some research. You should listen to people talk about it. You should hear a little bit about good and bad trips and, you know, make the decision for yourself for sure. Totally. And with Netflix and there being like a billion celebrities that have taken ayahuasca, mm -hmm. and like there's a lot, there's a whole cornucopia of shit for you to pull from right. if you want to get educated. Oh, absolutely. But it's badass. And we'll, you know, I'll talk, um, everybody that I have on this podcast will either um, hopefully have a psychedelic experience or have some really key questions that we can use to kind of guide the conversation, but I think that'll be a really key part of this podcast going forward. Absolutely. Um, we're about 45 minutes in. Let me see what else I had listed here to, to talk about. Um, Man, it is definitely a time capsule. It doesn't feel like 45. I know. Well, that, that was the best podcast, the ones where yeah. it just flies by. So, yeah. yeah, pat yourself on the back. <laughs> um, I do want to talk about unofficial sponsors. So, new podcast, episode two. Um, no official sponsors. I don't know if we ever will have official sponsors, but that doesn't keep me from uh, basically just touting great companies and brands as my unofficial sponsors. Right. So um, unofficially, I would have to say that uh, Fresh from the Farm Fungus, Fresh from the Farm Fungi, who is at the um, Cherry Creek Farmer's Market on Saturdays, 
unofficial sponsor. I'm kind of smitten by Fresh from the Farm Fungi. Um, they've uh, given me a lot of education in the world of bulk harvesting or bulk uh, growing methods and just kind of nerded out with me and talking about mushrooms. So unofficially, you're a sponsor. Um, you're welcome. Uh, <laughs> fresh from the Farm Fungi. Also, uh, Fresh Cat Mushrooms based out of Canada. If you go on YouTube, they have some amazing videos. Guy has a little Canadian uh, twang to him, eh? Uh, awesome. They don't do psychedelic mushrooms, just the, they're mushroom farmers, mm -hmm. but all the concepts apply and I love them very much. And, um, the last thing I want to say, unofficially Miller High Life has sponsored many episodes in my life. Uh, Miller High Life continues to sponsor this podcast. So thirdly, but not lastly, Miller High Life unofficial sponsor. Chris, uh, let's have some, some closing thoughts. Closing thoughts. Man, it's uh, an exciting world to dive into, and it'll definitely pull you in. So I, I watch some videos, Hell yeah. listen to some podcasts, and try it. There's no reason not to. <laughs> I, noticed, I noticed you shaved your mustache. Uh, I did. And uh, it took me the entire episode to notice. Ah. I was like, something's a little off about, about Chris. Yeah. The mustache is gone. How does, I, do you feel a little naked? Uh, so I never had a mustache until November 1st of last year and I shaved down to it and I loved it. Don't get me wrong. We loved, we all loved yeah, it. Yeah. I, it, it was just really nice. And then I decided I'd give it about a year. I think it's important not to be too attached to things, especially things that you're going to lose like hair and body and things like that. So I just figured I'd, I'd give it a year. I'd cut it off on November 1st and, uh, yeah. I imagine it'll be back at some point. We well, are a man of your word. You said November 1st and... Gosh darn it. <laughs> I love it. A um, couple questions for you. These are standard guest questions. Sure. Um, implementing these starting today. Okay. Um, not going to ask all the ones I have listed on this list because I think we've covered some. But I want to uh, I want to know if you could recommend one piece of art or literature to the audience, whether it be mushroom related or not. Chris's recommendation, not quite Oprah Book Club, but still relevant. What would you recommend? Sure. Uh, How to Change Your Mind, for sure, because it addresses kind of the spectrum of the mushroom experience from the science to the history to the experience, and I haven't even finished it yet. I love it. I love Now, for, uh, Fantastic Fungi, there's some overlap. Yes. Which was cool. I realized that when I watched Fantastic Fungi, I'm like, oh, wait, this is a lot of How to Change Your Mind. So Absolutely. that was really cool. Absolutely. So do both. Listen to How to Change Your Mind and watch Fantastic Fungi. Not in tandem. Kind of yeah. stagger them. Yeah. But they're both amazing. Mm -hmm. Good recommendation. I have one other question for you here. Sure. If you were a fighter, which secretly maybe you're a fighter. I don't think you are. But uh, you could if you needed to. What would be your walkout song? If you came out to the ring, the octagon, as a fighter, uh, what would hype you up? What would let the audience know uh, this shit is about to get real? I'll be honest. I think I'd have to go with uh, Digital Underground, the Humpty Hump. The Humpty Hump. If that doesn't instill fear in your opponent, I don't know what will. I love it. I love it. Uh, Chris, did you enjoy your first podcast experience? I enjoyed it, Dave, Ben. David, Ben. Like Uncle Ben, without the racism. Ah, yes. Less, much less. Ra no racism, actually. None. None. We will be very explicitly clear about that on this <laughs> podcast. None. <laughs> yeah, we'll, I'll say fuck occasionally, but absolutely no racism. Um, and on that note, thank you so much for being here, Chris. Thanks, uh, you brother. will be back. If you listen to Chris and you enjoyed his voice, he will be back. Maybe with a mustache, maybe not. I don't think it affects Who the knows? tone. Walk with me, walk with me, baby, come on.